Okay, I think we can start the session. Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this session, Photonic Technologies and the Pandemic. Uh, in this session, we will have two presentations. So let's start with the first one. The first one will be presented by Dolby Hirschbrook from Lionix International. Thank you very much for your introduction. So my name is Dawa Geusbroek. I'm from Linux International, the Netherlands. And I will present uh, something about the photonic technologies that we are working on and which has been accelerated by the pandemic times. So I will share my screen. And if you can all see it. And so, um, I would like to discuss some of the innovations and the applications of silicon nitride based integrated photonics. That's our core te technology and how that has been done in the, what has happened in the pandemic times for us. Um, so we are a photonic company, technology company in the European Union. Uh, we had lockdowns working from home. Fortunately, our labs were open. Uh, but with very limited access. So did everything come to a still stop? We only see uh, empty rooms. Well, fortunately for the Photonics Society, that, is, that was not the case. Uh, photonics uh, as being a very deep tech technology uh, supporting uh, technology, I think we saw an increase in, in, in all of our work. Uh, because of the market, which asked for uh, a couple of very strong demands. One was biosensor development, especially COVID detection, but also other uh, uh, early diagnosis tools. Uh, and also because we were all working from home, uh, we saw an increase in photonic communication technology requests from the market. So I would like to address both and discuss how uh, we do work in that area. So I would tell a bit about Linux International and uh, what we do in photonics there. And then uh, connect our work in biosensing and the tunable laser into the pandemic times uh, applications and how that uh, worked in that area. Uh, and I finally, I show some building blocks that might inspire uh, some of the work that other people are, are working on. There. So Linux International, so we are a leading global provider of customized microsystems solutions. Uh, customized microsystems means that we do photonic integrated circuits based on silicon nitrides, but we also have a strong background in what we call customized MEMS. So these are the uh, MEMS capabilities, but not, not the standard MEMS. We generally do the, the, more, the more funny things. Uh, we celebrate our 20th anniversary this year. So we have been around a long time. And we help uh, mainly OEMs and system integrators uh, providing their systems. We do that different than some other uh, for, uh, photonic IC companies. We are not a foundry. We don't call ourselves a foundry. We offer this technology in a vertical integration manner uh, where we can do the design, we can do the manufacturing, but most importantly, also the assembly and the packaging all in-house and all in scalable production volumes. Scalable production volumes means that we can scale with the growth of our clients, both from prototype to a high volume. But it also means that we can scale in between different uh, end volumes. Uh, being in silicon nitride uh, also means that we don't necessarily have applications that require 100,000 pieces a month. Uh, there are many high end applications in visible domain, for example, uh, where a thousand pieces a year is the whole market and we are, and we are fine to address also those. Uh, we maintain our technology leadership. We, has, we have been around for 20 years, always at the forefront of what's post possible and we do that and we maintain that there. So going to the biosensing, some of the context there, right? So you see that all the medicine is getting personalized and uh, it, and, and now the pandemic also drives to the point of need testing, fast and uh, accurate testing without any 
uh, dedicated facilities. Yeah, you need a rapid, rapid diagnosis for either cancer or for uh, COVID de detection, uh, but also for automated drug discovery and maybe even space ex exploration there. So the sensing that we do here is based in the photonics world, mainly at evanescent field sensing, where a waveguide is interacting with uh, the outside world. And you can either have some absorption or scattering, right? And because of that, you can sense something. The amount of absorption is your what you measure. You can also do fluor fluorescence, where uh, part of the light that you uh, let interact with that what you are measuring is uh, making another wavelength. And this the, the amount of the other wavelengths, the fluorescent light is the uh, is the amount of uh, measurement. And you can also have a refractive index sensing where you are actually looking at the face of the light and uh, the, you measure changes in uh, the effective refractive index. The last one I we, we do a lot of work on, uh, either with microrings or what we call asymmetric Marzino type structures. So both work that uh, a, a transfer function of a filter shape with the ring being a, a strong peak with the asymmetric machine art being more like a sinusoidal. Uh, it, it is moving uh, when the outside world changes, right? And, and even though uh, the micro ring has a very high peak and you can have a very <coughs> very a sharp edge there. Uh, we tend to, to use a lot of the A and Z eyes uh, because of the stability there and the long interaction length. We can make a very long path length in one of the arms. We can make a very long uh, interaction window with the, uh, with the outside world. Um, for example, this is a reference to a paper where they have changed, where they have found the, uh, the limits of detection for different kinds of structures. And there you see that the Marzino interferometer is one of the most sensitive ones when you're talking about detection of uh, refractive index units. Um, we do it label free. Uh, that's more with the bio, bio, uh, biochemistry, which is on top of the sensor, right? In, in principle, the sensor is a, a refractive index unit sensing system. The advantage is that you can multiplex a lot and you can balance it or you can self-reference it because you can integrate many of these sensors on a very small uh, area, right? Because it's chip-based, you can integrate a lot of other functionalities, also uh, fluidics, electronics, or even other parts uh, to get to a very compact structure there. And so when, what we have seen in uh, the pandemic times is that this, uh, this technology that we have been working on a long time uh, has, has picked up enormously in pace. And some of the examples of that are a uh, work that we do together with another company called uh, Surfix Diagnostics, where they uh, want to detect disease markers in minutes. This is a plug and play instrument where you can multiplex, where all the handling and bio friction, uh, all the fluidic handling is in it. And uh, one of the main tricks that Surfix does is that they have a biofunctional coating, which is selective. So it only binds to the silicon nitride in our case. So you have a very, uh, an increase in sensitivity there because you are only measuring there where the light is. But everything is integrated there in optics, electronics, sample prep, prep preparation, and it's volume man manufacturable as well. Um, and these, uh, Surfix is targeting both COVID detection as well as um, the early cancer diagnosis, especially in urine, where they are looking for uh, cancer markers in urine. Uh, related to that, you can, uh, once, you know, once you have a platform where you can sense uh, RNA or DNA, you can also have other applications there. So in a project 
called SensiChip. Uh, the same technology is used for uh, finding infectious diseases in, in water cultures. So that's uh, uh, in this case used in uh, fish farms where uh, fish are grown for food production. And uh, yeah, to reduce the antibiotic use and to increase uh, the health of the animals that we use for food later on. So I think that's the nice thing about uh, the pandemic times. It, the COVID has driven a lot of uh, investments there, but it can be used as, as well for many other applications that, that, that are closely related to that. So part of our background there, so we, we have done similar things. Live marker is one of them where this fluorescence detection was used and which uh, was scheduled to send out to Mars to detect if there are uh, biological molecules on Mars. Unfortunately, it didn't make the end payroll yet or the end uh, role yet, uh, payload yet. Um, but that's uh, an option which you can do there. It's also a fully integrated system with uh, fluidics and a optical readout integrated to it. Another application for this is small molecule screening, where you can do very rapid screening of all kinds of uh, medicines, uh, either to find new medicines or to make it uh, personalized to the user. So another application where we saw a, a big increase in questions from the market in pandemic times was uh, the datacom, right? Everybody's working from home. So all our telecom infrastructure and the datacom infrastructure was uh, running at its limits. And uh, one of the key work that we done there is a development from it from uh, where, where we had made a tunable laser using our technology there. Uh, which drives, which is driven by uh, the increased capacity of these uh, networks, uh, and as, as, especially the flexibility within these kind of systems. So, an integrated uh, tunable laser is needed there to uh, uh, do signal processing or even uh, remote sensing. There. So, how does that work in our case? So, we use silicon nitride as a core technology where you cannot make any light. So how we use it is we use it by hybrid integration. So we have a enium phosphide based gain section and we attach it to a silicon nitride based mirror. In that case, we have a best of both worlds where uh, the platform that can generate light generates light and the uh, platform that is low, that has low losses, silicon nitride, uh, does what it's good at and that's having low losses. Right, so we have made a, a reflector, and in this case, we have a, made a double ring reflector where uh, two different peaks of two different uh, uh, micro ring resonator are used as a, a reflective mirror, which is tunable. And we've used two rings of these to apply the Fernier effect there, which have a broader span of uh, the co combined uh, the co combined structure uh, with respect to the single one. And we can tune these. We can tune uh, these peaks in individually. If you combine that then to a structure like this, where here is a, this should be the SOA. Somehow the text is not showing. But this is the, the SOA part of the, of the system co connected to uh, our tunable mirror. And you can see a very, a very sharp peak. A very sharp peak is because of the low losses. You get narrow line widths. It's a high quality cavity there and with a long path length. Uh, and you, I mean, we can tune it. We can tune it very broadly uh, over 50 nanometers up to 100 nan nanometers. It's, this can be tuned in the C band. So that's uh, the hybrid integrated narrow line width laser, in this case at 1550 nanometer. So typically, you can tune over the whole C-band with line widths lower than 100 kilohertz. Uh, the line widths can go down if you play uh, with the cavity design. The 
limit there uh, is looked after, but at this moment it has proven to go as low as 40 hertz uh, with a very long cavity uh, made this way, uh, work by University of Twente. Uh, the tuning speeds are in the order of a kilohertz. These are all ter thermally actuated. The output powers, uh, typically it's 100 milliwatt, uh, sorry, uh, 10 milliwatts. Uh, with some tricks, we can go up to 100 milliwatts if needed. Right, so it's a high Q cavity uh, where we can, so the nice thing about silicon nitride is that it can deal with very high powers. So uh, it doesn't become uh, non-linear very fast. And uh, one of the tricks that we can do within a silicon nitride is a very good spot size converter. Uh, converting the spots from the silicon nitride to the one in the enium phosphide, therefore having very low masses. So uh, other works in this, uh, area is that this technique is being used now and it's being uh, scaled into volumes uh, and fun functionalities are added. For example, a dual gain laser when you have two lasers on the same platform, either beating, beating against each other uh, to make a, a third sex signal or you can use it as a, as a, as a dual line laser. Um, this is technology that we that we think at the, at this moment is so robust that we even offer it in our multi-project performance. So um, it is a hybrid approach. So in in uh, very uh, easy ways, we basically glue two pieces each other. So how how solid is that, and how how reliable is that? Well, it has uh, survived 40G aeronautical shock tests. And we've also shown, demonstrated that it can function at only three Kelvin, very low temperatures. So uh, stability wise, this is, a, this is a good approach. Uh, the, the novelties and what the market requires now is to do this at also at different wavelengths, right? Uh, 780 quantum sensing or quantum com com computing uh, re requires that, uh, or quantum key distri distri distribution requires that uh, OCC CCT a scanning laser at 850 nan nanometer is very favorable there. And we can even go as low to the visible wavelengths and do this as, as, as well. We have a paper published together with University of Twente where we have shown the first visible tunable laser but using this approach, uh, which can be of interest in, uh, if, for example, AR VR applications or other pr projection, visible projection systems. So to close this session there, I like to say think big, right? Not think big, but think big, because uh, if you're thinking about the building blocks that, that you are available in, Photonic integrated circuits. You can make new systems uh, uh, that yeah, have not been possible before that. In our case, based on low loss silicon nitride waveguides with a broad transparency, low loss, a very small bending radius, and a spot size converter. So, in terms of uh, building blocks, coupling in and out of the light, uh, Lyons International always says that we don't sell uh, chips, we do modules because our clients cannot deal with a chip. You always need to provide an interface. And in this interface in telecommunication, of course, is a fiber. In many other, other applications, there are many other interfaces. So thinking about the interfaces, uh, either being pixels that you can flip chip, or photodiodes, or uh, in the outputs, you can have fibers or gratings or mirrors. It is all, always about the system that is that makes a photonic integrated circuit work. And we are glad that even in the pandemic times, which has been hard for many people, we see that photonics technology can make a difference. And that's one of the uh, drivers of Linux. It has been a driver for Dionix since uh, 20 years that we believe that photonics and integrated photonics especially can help change the world.
So um, some of the other applications that we are working on, I would be happy to discuss some of the challenges that other people have. And I would like to thank you for your attention here. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, we have time for one or two questions. Uh, if you have questions, you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Maybe I can ask one. I'm very interested in that uh, life marker that you yeah. can send to Mars. Uh, yeah. how, how does that work? Would that be in a robot's arm and it it will touch surfaces or or it will be left on the Mars and someone would take it uh, afterwards. How, how does that work? Uh, it was scheduled to be on a on, on one of the the Asia rovers uh, that would collect dust and do uh, uh, and all the all the uh, it would stay there. So all the measurements, all the pre 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 preparation, all the the measurements were done uh, in the Mars rover, and only uh -huh. data would, would be sent back there. Okay, and yeah. the one chip will be uh, reused many times for many samples. For yeah, or... for, for okay. different samples. Yeah, yeah, for or many. I, I I think there there was a number uh, in the amount of of uh, measure, uh, measurements that you can do. Yeah, but it's, okay. Uh, yeah, it's more than one, but not unlimited, of course. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Excuse me. Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Do, uh, how are you? Hello. Uh, one question: How we can use uh, terahertz uh, signal in photonic, or exploit it, or vice versa? Use photonic in terahertz. Yeah, um, terahertz is so. For example, our uh, our um, dual line laser. Uh, can be used as a as a ter terahertz generating source, where you beat two optical signals each, uh, to each other and make a terahertz signal there. Uh, so that that's one of the first examples there. We see a lot of uh, so we use a lot of Linux is working on a lot of uh, microwave photonics mm -hmm. uh, work where 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 optic where high speed analog signals are transferred over uh, uh, optical signals uh, to be transferred, transported and uh, processed. So that's an area where, where it can be used, where terahertz and photonics are used. Okay. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we have to move on. So thank okay. you very much for the presentation. Yeah. You're the welcome. next one will be presented by Eric Swanson from Nisha. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me share my screen. All good, you can see it. Yes. All right, perfect. Thank you again for the introduction. My name is Eric Swenson. I'm a general manager with Nietzsche America Corporation. Uh, talk today, solid state lighting, LED lighting at a crossroads beyond the flip of a switch. So variety of topics, all kind of tied and linked with the pandemic era, but also a transition in technology for um, artificial light. So with that, as I dive in, a uh, little background on Nietzsche. We are a, a very old, uh, established in 1956, privately held company, still family owned. Uh, we were founded as a specialty chemical company, actually uh, processing calcium compounds for the pharmaceutical industry. With that, we quickly transitioned into becoming the world's largest phosphor manufacturer, providing phosphor materials to the world's largest fluorescent lighting manufacturers. We were fortunate to hold that title for about 40 years. And then in the 90s, we kind of evolved a little bit. And in 1993, we invented the high brightness blue LED. And three years later, Nietzsche invented the high brightness white LED. That really changed the company. It changed the world. 
Uh, we blew up as a company that makes up about 75% of our, our business today. Uh, we do, do still manufacture a lot of specialty chemicals, like it says here, lithium ion battery materials. Uh, global company, over 9,400 employees globally. Almost all of that is in Japan, uh, all of our manufacturing in Japan as well. So we're fortunate to be the world's largest LED manufacturer today by a significant margin. Uh, we do have LEDs for every application that, that you might see LEDs used in from LCD backlighting, general lighting, which is what I'm going to be talking about more so today. Uh, automotive, of course, video display, laser diodes, UV LEDs, which are, are being talked a lot about today during the pandemic in terms of germicidal usage. So these benefits, or excuse me, these uh, this diversity really has helped Nietzsche a lot remain a very stable LED manufacturer, especially during the pandemic at a time when a lot of LED manufacturers are, are struggling to survive. Um, so again, taking a deeper dive into the general lighting space is my point today. And anytime I give a talk, I, I love quotes um, with this one here, the achievement of one goal should be the starting point of another. And if this was in person, I would challenge the audience to, to guess who this person is. Um, since we're not, I'll just call it out. It is Alexander Graham Bell, uh, one of the um, arguably inventors of the, of the phone. So to start the, the put your mind in the right frame, uh, I want to talk about the evolution of the phone a little bit and just just visually graphically really quickly. Uh, when we look back in the 50s, you had the switchboards, you had the operators. OK, in the 60s, we had that, that classic dial tone, uh, excuse me, dial phone. Uh, always fun to, to look back on in the 70s. OK, we switched over to this style with the touch pads. 80s are getting a little more complicated, a little bit more technology driven. Uh, of course, then in the 90s, we had a lot of transition to portable phones and, of course, the cell phone. But all of these did one function. They enabled us to talk. They enabled us to make phone calls. That was their solo function. And then again, in the 90s, fortunately, with the invention, Nietzsche's invention of the, the white LED, we now had colored cell phones and the first colored cell phone came out in 1999. So again, this is all just to put a, a bug in your head and get you thinking. So, okay, great, we have colored phones. Uh, still, just make a phone call is what they did. So imagine uh, for over a hundred years um, using a product to do just one task well, that changed, fortunately, and we took something that we were using to do one task and doing something completely new. So again, a smartphone came about. Now imagine trying to apply that to something different. Imagine trying to apply that to lighting. And that is where we've been using the same thing for a hundred years, different products, different types of technologies, but to do one thing, and that's to, to light up a room, light up a space. And now in a pandemic, when we are spending a lot more time under artificial light, consider that. So with solid state lighting and the LED adoption, we, we've kind of gone through the, the first phase of LED adoption. And that focus was strictly on energy savings. There was some other benefits in plays, no doubt, reliability being one of them, but mostly on energy savings. And this is a a chart referenced pretty regularly in the solid state lighting industry, talking about the adoption curve and the efficiency efficacy curve over time. We were stuck pretty plateaued for a very long time until LEDs came around. And then fortunately over the last 20 years, we've seen a dramatic hockey stick growth in terms of efficacy and we can celebrate that. We should celebrate that we're over 20 times greater the efficiency of most traditional technologies. And that's been accomplished really in about 15 years. When I started with Nietzsche back in 2007, we were talking about LEDs that were 30 lumens per watt. And the, the talk was, man, if we could reach 100 lumens per watt, game over, ball game, it'd be, we, we're there, we've accomplished our goal. But now the industry is well over 200 lumens per watt, well over 220 lumens per watt. So it's a great uh, accomplishment. And, and that goal of energy efficiency has been achieved. So with that, let's set out, let's set a new goal as Alexander Graham Bell mentioned. So we move on to phase two, and this is where we're at the crossroads. 
which path do we take as an industry for phase two? One path is to, to stick with our full color cell phones. So again, to use that phone evolution reference, we've got something good. We, we've accomplished something good with solid state lighting. We have uh, replacement bulbs, we have replacement lamps, we have tape light, we have solid state lighting troffers and fixtures in our offices. These are good enough and we've accomplished the efficiency goals. But I asked the, the question to the industry, do we stick with that? Do we stick with what's good enough and simply make things cheaper and, and allow us to just function in one way and to provide light to an open space just in that sense? But with that, where does that lead us? What type of quality concerns do we have if we go down that path of just make it cheaper, which we hear a lot of? Do we have supply chain issues? Because again, we're focused on cost only. Ultimately, as I'm speaking to a lot of engineers and my background is in engineering, it's boring. That's not innovative. We still have so many more opportunities. Um, and here again, I like to reference my quotes. So Hall of Fame wide receiver, the 49ers said, the enemy of the best is good. If you're always settling for what's good, you'll never be the best. And that leads me to what I want to propose and, and talk about a lot in the lighting industry is path two. And that is to continue to innovate and create our own smartphone, find a new way to make lighting provide more function. And that is the key point is to use solid state lighting, use LEDs to provide light, functional light beyond just lighting up a space. And the tools are there. The tools from LED manufacturers, from fixture manufacturers are there and ready to be used if users are willing to accept it and do more than just light up a space. So examples of that as we dive a little bit deeper into this, and like I say here, now's the time to have fun, especially as uh, technology people, as innovators, as engineers. We've done the energy savings thing. I've said that several times. Now with LEDs, we have the latest technologies. We have the opportunity to focus on quality of light and providing a much better light source for the, the world that we live in, whether that's inside in my office, whether that's... Um, the street lights and providing safer lighting for, for our towns and cities, we can focus on the quality of light. Smart lighting, this is being done uh, in a lot of places right now, or available, I should say, to be done. And that's using light to control uh, different features and, and have it be controlled by our cell phone. Um, and then a whole lot of new features, again, which I'll take a deeper dive into, one being human-centric lighting, um, different ways to improve the performance, not just at the LED level, at the semiconductor level, but at the system level. Different ways to use light to increase productivity amongst people. Uh, so a lot of great concepts and tools at our hands. And some examples of these coming out of, out of Nietzsche and our innovation over the last couple of years in terms of quality of light. Again, having light sources that, that are perfect that, that in terms of rendering colors light sources that match the, the rendering of the sun, light sources that match the rendering of halogen light sources. Over the development of LEDs, they, they have not always rendered light, uh, rendered colors the way that an artist, perhaps as an example, intended it to be. So imagine shining an LED light source on the Mona Lisa and having it look washed out and faded or um, LED lighting in a surgical suite and, and the doctor performing surgery notices the blood is, is um, faded and is not red, is not really as, as oxygen or looks oxygen deprived, all just because of the light source. So that we can accomplish better now with LEDs. We have these opportunity or excuse me, options. Historically, when you go up with higher CRIs, higher quality of light, historically, you, you lose out in efficiency. There was a trade-off. You wanted 90 plus CRI, you would take a 15 to 20% hit in efficacy. Well, no longer. Again, another tool uh, in the toolbox is LEDs that have a unique spectrum that, that optimizes the efficiency of the LED. So you can accomplish 90 plus CRI without sacrificing any efficacy. So if you had your choice to get your cake and eat it too, uh, you got it now. And then as we look into the outdoor space, uh, high pressure sodium lights are, are still used extensively throughout the world. A lot of it has to do with their color and the nostalgic look that comes with that color of a high pressure sodium light. 
Uh, historically, LEDs have not matched that in terms of color. They have not gotten as warm a CCT as most uh, high pressure sodium lights. Well, now you have that tool in your toolbox. You can accomplish that 1800 Kelvin, very nostalgic amberish look in your cities, in your decorative streetlights. You can match that historic look with a much higher uh, quality of light. So now achieving a CRI of greater than 70 versus high pressure sodium less than 10, that improves visibility, that improves safety. Uh, you're able to do this with LEDs, which of course are much longer lifetimes, as it says, greater than two and a half times the, the reliability, excuse me, not reliability, but two and a half times the lifetime of high pressure sodium. So a lot of benefits here, just in terms of high quality of light. Human centric lighting has received a lot of buzz over the last year, not so much implemented yet, uh, mainly just due to the questions around um, how does it work? What effect does it really have? But imagine utilizing light to stimulate, stimulate your body and match your circadian cycle. Um, there are options in the market now where you can have and tune your lighting depending on the time of day, not just the color, but the spectrum of the light, give you light that energizes you, give you light that prepares you for sleep. And, and at different times of the day, utilizing your night source, or excuse me, utilizing your light source to match your circadian cycle. Again, another tool in the toolbox. Next, I touched on a little bit is color tuning. Again, another recent innovation in terms of LED lighting that uh, allows you to do things you haven't done before. So color tuning sometimes is looked at uh, in terms of human centric lighting, but it can be anywhere. Imagine um, you wanting to have your uh, kitchen at 5,000 Kelvin while you're preparing dinner, but then as you're eating dinner, you want to switch it over to 2,700 Kelvin. You have options. If you're a manufacturer and you want to keep inventory in your warehouse of one SKU, one CCT SKU versus six different CCTs, you have the option with this where you're able to tune and get multiple colors out of a single LED, out of a single light emitting surface as well. This allows you to accomplish that, allows you to do unique things optically that you haven't been able to do before. Again, another tool in the toolbox. And there are a variety more here. I'm not going to get into depth on these, but a lot having to do with optics that the industry has not implemented in full yet. But being able to utilize primary optics within the LED to create different form factors of a, of a light fixture. We've seen this in Japan, very, very creative, where been able to make a, a light fixture that is much smaller, much lighter, much thinner, because of the optical distribution of the LED. And by doing so in, within the ceiling, when you install this light fixture, you don't need as much weight support. You don't need as much um, infrastructure within the ceiling. And therefore they're able to shrink the gap of the ceiling on a tall multi-story building to the point where uh, the building is much more efficient. They were able to even build another level or two in the building because of shrinking those gaps uh, between floors. Second, I touched on this a little bit, little bit ago, is germicidal disinfection and disinfecting a space. Um, you can utilize very short, deep UVC wavelengths to disinfect, inactivate viruses and bacteria, but you can also use visible light to accomplish this as well. So this is an example of a 405 nanometer LED um, producing white light. It's phosphor converted 405 nanometer producing white light in a space where you can inactivate bacteria. You can inactivate uh, viruses, including SARS-CoV-2. So very exciting space there that's just starting to uh, get going. Again, touching on optics and optimizing our secondary optics, this is being talked a lot about, is not having wasted light, being able to put the light where you want it and when you want it, which again touches on the controls and having the light when you need it. And really the ultimate most efficient light source is one that's off. So if you can control the light and have it on when you need it to, that's a big advantage. Uh, lastly as well, another um, technology, I shouldn't say lastly, because there's many more, but uh, I'm touching on is Li-Fi. Again, another innovative uh, concept to utilize light in a way it's never been used before. The 
response times of LEDs are so fast that they can enable communication between devices. So again, just being scratched. So yes, lighting has a lot more innovation, a lot more to be implemented, far beyond what we've ever done before, far beyond just lighting up a space. So I challenge everyone within the industry, whether as a manufacturer or even as a con consumer to, to do something different, do something more sustainable, do something to continue to innovate and create. Do think about lighting early, not last. Oftentimes lighting is the last thing thought about in a building or in a home. Think about it early and build around lighting and do more than just flip the switch. Lighting can do a lot more. So challenge everyone. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, we have time for perhaps one question. If you have one, please just unmute yourself and you can ask a question. Hello, and thank you very much for your very nice presentation. I have a question. What is your conclusion? Why uh, industry or people doesn't use uh, to, or don't use uh, a lot of uh, opportunities that we, we now have with, uh, with beautiful lighting sources? It's a great question and, and something I think about often. And it's disappointing that they haven't yet. And I think it's always because I, I always fall back on lighting is taken for granted. It's always been there and it's always been a uh, grocery store purchase as a consumer. You don't say, oh, my light bulb's out. I need to go buy light bulbs. No, it's you're at the grocery store. Oh yeah, the light's out. I need to get something. It's always in commercial spaces. Like I said, it's thought about last. They've, all, they've done the rest of the building. And, oh yeah, we got to buy the light fixtures. Oh, but our budget is short. So just do something cheap and quick. No, think about it early when you can build around everything, when you can, when you're, you're placing lighting in the building and around windows, being able to utilize the sun and daylight harvesting, incorporate that into building infrastructure. Um, when you think about it earlier in the process, you're able to incorporate a lot of this stuff. And quite frankly, some of the new innovations, there's still question marks around the return on investment. That is definitely a big question mark, especially on human centric lighting. It's easy to quantify human centric lighting in a manufacturing environment. For example, when you talk about safety, reducing safety or injuries or productivity, but when you put it in an office or a school, okay, yes, my kids are more, uh, are doing better, maybe have better test scores. And that's great for the, the human element of it, but. Um, is it worth me paying more money to install that? That's a big question that um, I have confidence will be resolved soon. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I think we are um, at our time limit. So uh, thank you very much, um, Eric and uh, our two speakers. And this is the end of this session. And thank you very much for attending and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, have a great day. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.